Hello, my name is Arnaud Delorme, and this presentation is about general linear modeling in EGLAB LIMO. There are two parts to this presentation. The first one has to do with theory, and the second one uh, with practice. So EGLAB has been developed by ourselves at UCSD, and LIMO has been developed by Cyril Pernay at the University of Edinburgh with input from us. LIMO is one of the most important plugins of uh, EGLAB. In this presentation, there's a lot of statistics. I want to mention, though, that I'm not a statistician. This is actually good uh, because you might actually stand a chance to understand what I'm talking about. However, although I'm convinced that none of the concepts in this presentation are inaccurate, there might be simplifications uh, which a statistician would judge outrageous. So bear that in mind. First, I'm going to explain to you why we use the general linear model. The general linear model is a method that encompasses most statistics you might already know, such as t-test, simple regression, multiple regression, ANOVA, ANCOVA, etc. But it also allows designing more complex models, as I will explain here. So first, a regression is a linear model. Imagine a psychophysics experiment where images with different contrasts are presented and we ask participants to press a button whenever they see an animal. This is actually an experiment we've done and this is the histogram of reaction time for different levels of contrast. Now we want to model this behavior with a linear regression. Our model is that the reaction time is equal to a factor multiplied by the contrast of the image plus a constant and a narrow term. We will call this constant beta zero, which is the intercept, and this factor beta one, which is the slope. We can do some simple calculation or use our preferred software to find the parameter beta zero and beta one that best uh, satisfy this formula. Here, for example, we obtain a beta zero of 2.7 and a beta one of 23.6. So we have built a simple linear model, which is a type of uh, GLM. Here is another representation of this model. For each trial, we have a different error and we try to minimize this error. Now to test if the model is useful, we can compute significance. To do so, we compare the fit of this model, so the R square value, with the fit of a simpler model where we would not have the parameter beta one. We can also calculate the confidence interval of the beta one parameter and assess if zero is included in the 95% confidence interval of beta one. If zero is not included, it means that beta one is significantly different from zero. So this was a simple, if not the simplest uh, form of uh, GLM. Now an ANOVA is also a, general, uh, a linear model. Imagine an experiment where you, have, you would have three categories of images containing an animal. You would still respond only when the image contains an animal, but now we want to know if people respond faster on images of reptile than on images of fishes or bird. For example, there might be an instinctive response to be faster to move when we see a snake or another reptile. To do so, we would use this type of linear model, where we now have one beta parameter per category of animal. That is to say the data, for example, reaction time is equal to a constant term, the grand mean beta zero, plus the effect of treatment beta one for fishes, beta two for birds, beta three for reptiles, and the error term epsilon. For example, for trial four, which would be the first presentation of fishes, we have reaction times is equal to beta zero plus beta two plus the error term. For trial 13, which would be the second trial containing an image of birds, we have the same relationship with a different error term. Note that beta two is a number that cannot vary across trials, only the error vary across trials for a given category of image. We would have a similar relationship for reaction times on images of fishes, where we'd use beta one, and for reptiles, where we, use, we would use beta three. The ANOVA variables are categorical variables that can only be zero and one in this case, encoding the type of animal. And the contrast variable in the previous slide was a continuous variable that could take any value. To assess if the model is significant, the fit of the model with the beta parameter for each category, the R square, is compared with the fit of the model without these beta parameters. 
if it is significantly different, the ANOVA is significant. Again, this is a GNN that is strictly equivalent to performing uh, an ANOVA. Now, a GLM can actually model both a regression and an ANOVA at the same time, which is an ANCOVA. Still using the same example, now we vary both the category of the target image and the contrast. Again, again we measure reaction time. For example, for a trial that contains a, a bird at a given contrast, we would have the beta parameters corresponding to the ANOVA, as we saw in the previous slide, plus the beta parameters, in this case, beta 4, corresponding to contrast. As you can, you can see how easy it is to create more complex GLM and add new variables, both continuous for regression and categorical for ANOVA. Now let's see how we can easily visualize which beta parameter is associated with each trial. Imagine we have 12 trials and four groups of images. So GP represent groups here. So we have three trials for image of group one, three trials of image of group two, etc. This is exactly the same as we've done with images of different types for the ANOVA, except now we have four groups instead of three. Also, we have the result now in variable Y instead of reaction time. We can represent these 12 equations using matrix notation, where we have a column vector representing the result, which is equal to the design matrix containing 0 and 1, multiplied by a vector of beta parameters plus some error. The design matrix is often represented by this type of checkerboard where we encode ones as white cells and zeros as black cells. And you'll often see this type of representation in the literature. Now let's move to EEG and ERP processing. Let's first look at a single electrode and focus on the first sample of multiple trial. Each trial has a, corresp has a corresponding row in the design matrix here we have two categories of stimuli and a continuous parameter, which is the noise in the stimulus. For example, it can be a noisy image. You can see that the noise column, in the noise column that we have gray level indicating we have more than zero and ones. We have a full gradient of noise values. To fit the GLM, we optimize beta parameters at each latency, and we do that iteratively at all latencies. So we have a lot of GLM to fit. So now we have beta 1, uh, beta 2, etc. across time, and we can build ERP-like diagrams out of them. So we can assess how the EEG data respond to the presentation of different types of stimuli. For continuous variable, in this case, the stimulus noise level, we have an image, a 3D image. In this case, trials have been sorted by the amount of noise. So we can clearly see how the amount of noise affect single trial beta ERP. What is the difference between fitting a GLM on one hand and doing two separate statistical analysis, a regression plus an ANOVA uh, of the EEG on the other hand? Looks like it's the same, right? Well, it's not. The advantage of doing both at the same time when we fit a GLM is that we regress out contribution of other factors. Assuming the beta parameters corresponding to the noise uh, model accurately, uh, the response of the EEG9 to the noise content of the image, when we fit, uh, when the GLM fits beta parameters for the type of image, so the ANOVA part, it does that independently of the noise. It does it as if we, the noise had been removed. By contrast, if you fit a regression on one hand, and an ANOVA, on the other hand, the computation of beta for the ANOVA might be biased by the noise content of uh, the stimulus. To assess if we have a significant difference between types uh, of images, we can also subtract the beta parameters and assess if 95, the 95% confidence interval of the difference overlap with zero. If it does, the beta parameters is not significant, uh, and to calculate the 95% confidence interval of the difference, we could use parametric statistics. But we usually use bootstrap where we repetitively uh, take a subsample of trial and we compute the model to determine how the beta parameters are affected. I put a link in the description uh, on the lecture on confidence interval, bootstrap and statistics. 
And of course, we have more than one electrode. So we have to repeat that for all electrodes. Then we can extract scalp topography of beta parameters at latency of interest. And also assess significance using the 95% confidence interval, as I just mentioned. When you only have two types of stimuli, instead of scalp topography of beta, we can also plot scalp topography of EEG potential difference between stimulus type then we can use the same mass for significance as we were using for the beta parameters. Again, if you just have two types of stimuli uh, in your model, applying this mask would be equivalent to performing a t-test between your sets of ERP for each stimulus and thresholding the scalp topography at a p-value of 0.05. Note that we really fit a large number of models here. One model at each sample multiplied by the number of electrodes. So of course we need to correct for multiple comparison. There's multiple ways to correct for multiple comparison and I invite you to again look at the statistics lecture link in the description for more information. I want to point, on this, point out on this slide that even for a given experiment you can model your data in different ways. For example, say you have four types of visual stimuli red disk, green disk, red square, and green square. The default design matrix is to have one beta factor for each type of stimulus. This is called an interaction design and is shown here in section one. With this design, you can still compare between red and green stimulus by summing beta. For example, difference between red and green would be beta one plus beta three minus beta two and beta four. Difference between square and circle would be beta 1 plus beta 2 minus beta 3 and beta 4. Alternatively, you can model it differently with one beta for square, one beta for circle, one beta for green, and one beta for the red color. This is called a factorial design. Now square versus circle is beta 1 minus beta 2, and red versus green is beta 3 minus beta 4. This type of design is rarely used, but it's still valid. A third design, which is called the full factorial design, will combine both. It will model, model both uh, main effect of each stimulus characteristics and interaction between them. What do I mean by interaction? For example, it might be that shape has an effect on the EEG, that color has another additive effect, but that red square have a very special effect. There is an interaction between the two characteristics red and square that leads to unique EEG characteristics. The full factorial design can be used when you want to study interaction at the single subject level. However, however otherwise uh, interaction are usually modeled at the second level and we'll see that in a second. So I've shown you how to apply a GLM at the single subject level. We can even perform statistics across trial for single participants. Now let's move to the group level analysis. Well, group level analysis is simple. It's the same as performing group level analysis of ERPs. However, instead of using average electrode time course for each subject as input, we use beta time course as input. Instead of using the grand average ERP for a given type of stimulus, we use the grand average beta parameter representing that type of stimulus. If you have a simple model with only different types of stimulus in your model, performing statistics on the beta will actually be equivalent as performing statistics on the ERP. Now that this is true only if you're using the ordinary least square method to optimize beta parameters. If you're using the alternative weighted least square method, then there is automatic weighting of individual trials to minimize artifacts, so we no longer have the equivalence with channel ERPs. Also, if you include continuous variable, variables, this will not be equivalent as I explained uh, previously. So in this specific case, we can perform a two-way repeated measure ANOVA, or the equivalent EGLM design. The first main effect will, be, will indicate the influence of shape on the EEG data. The second main effect will uh, indicate the influence of color and the interaction turns possible interaction between shape and color. This is why you do not need to compute interactions at the first level. Instead, you do it at the second level, as you would have done with ERP. Again, this must be done at each latency for each electrode, so we will need to correct for multiple comparisons. 
I mentioned previously that you could also use a full factorial design model at the first level. In this case, you have already extracted interactions at the first level, so you cannot recompute them at the second level. If you have a full factorial uh, design model at the first level, you could use a two sample pair t test between the beta for square and, uh, and beta for disk to assess the effect of shape. The effect of color would be a, a group two sample pair t test between beta for red and beta for green. And for interaction effect, we can perform a one sample t test to assess if any of the interaction terms are uh, different from zero across subjects. This second model makes sense if you want to study interaction at the single subject level. Limo and EGLAB will use the model on the previous slide by default, but they allow you to use that model as well. Also, I want to reiterate that this is not, uh, this is a high level explanation. There's a lot of detail pertaining to the optimization of these models and the statistical assumptions for using them. For example, I mentioned on this slide and the previous one, that we simply apply another GLM at the second level. However, at the second level, instead of a standard GLM, Cyril Perna is using Oteling uh, statistical test, which do not need to be corrected for sphericity of the data and for potential uh, correlations between measure, measures. I invite you to look at the relevant publications in the link in the description. Finally, and this is my last slide, why do a complex two-level hierarchical GLM model why we could use a simpler mixed effect model where we model the different participants using additional beta parameters? So this is represented here on the left. You can see that now I have a design matrix that represents all the trials from all the participants with three additional columns at the beginning to indicate which participant the trials belong to. If the trials belong to subject one, I put one in the first column of this design matrix. If a trial belongs to subject two, I put one in the second column of this design matrix, etc. This does seem much simpler and elegant. And again, it's perfectly fine to use this model. However, in practice, both when using LIMO and when using SPM for fMRI, the two-level hierarchical model is preferred. Uh, the reason is first computational. The model with all the participants is going to be very large and take a long time to process. Not all the data may fit in memory, so there are additional practical considerations. In practice, Cyril Pernay has showed that both models return comparable results. So even though the mixed model effect uh, is the more theoretically valid, it is fine to use the hierarchical model instead. And again, this is what people have been doing in fMRI for the past 25 years. I put a link uh, to his paper in the description. I also want to point out that some researchers use GLM on EEG data in a different way. For example, some researchers have used beta parameters to model time. This is, for example, useful when you have stimuli that overlap in time. Or it might be possible to use beta parameters to model electrodes. So it's not necessary to run a GLM for each time sample and each electrode. Everything would be already included in the model at the cost of having a model with a very, very large number of beta parameters. So this approach is not possible by LIMO, but I, uh, it's good to know that it exists. So uh, I hope you know a little bit more about GLM right now, and I want to thank you for your attention and maybe see you in one of the next video.